Good morning. Welcome to Woodland United Methodist Church. Welcome on this 4th of July Sunday. As we think about our country, about our founding fathers, about how we all have this country began and where it has come. It began in a place where, you know, there was a lot of struggles and there were still some things that needed to be worked out that hadn't been worked out, but they came together to start something. You have to start something to get somewhere, so they started something, this country. I am happy to think about the words of Thomas Jefferson, though he was not a perfect man and he had a lot of flaws, but he made a statement that was very, very important. He said, we were endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, that was a powerful statement. One thing is saying that there are certain rights that we need to stand up for, and those are rights that actually God has given us. So our government doesn't give us those rights. God gives us those rights. And he was suggesting that maybe we could form a government that would make sure that God's rights are being enforced for the people, keeping them safe and able to do the things that they feel led of God to do in their own personal lives. Freedom of the individual to be who they are called to be, or who they feel led to become. That's what he's talking about. Now, something has happened about that, and we may have lost touch with that understanding of the rights that God has given us, because sometimes people even today begin to believe that they have the right to discriminate, the right to put people down, the right to exclude people. And then they will argue when the government comes or, or the police come and tell them that they've just violated the law or if someone calls them and says they're, they're in trouble because they violated the law and you say, wait a minute, what are these, these man-made laws when I've been given by God the right to do what I think is best? That's what it means to be American, but that's not true. What it means to be American, according to Thomas Jefferson, and what we were trying to start, the holy experiment they called it at the time, was that we have certain rights from God. And when we talk about whether this is a right from God, we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing? If you're discriminating against someone, if you're excluding someone, if you're saying I have a right not to care about that person or to serve that person or to help that person, those aren't rights that come from God. You can't even imagine that God told you that's what I have for you. Those are rights you're imposing on yourself, but by doing the imposing, you're taking away someone else's rights. And that is a violation of the law, but not only that, it is disrespecting what our country was supposed to be founded on, the principles of protecting and caring for everyone and treating everyone equally as a part of our family here. 
So we have to never forget that distinction. We have to never forget that we have been endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which includes the right to gather and worship. There are some countries where that's not possible. There are some countries, well, even though it's not possible, people do it anyway. They are in danger of being locked up, being tortured, and being killed. But they stand up anyway because they believe they're supposed to gather in the house of God. So if you're able to get out and you're able to travel, then we ask you to honor our, us honor our country also by coming into worship and celebrating that we have the right to gather in God's house and we have the calling to gather in the sanctuary of God and to worship and to celebrate our family and what we have. So let's remember these things today on this 4th of July as we celebrate everything that God has given us and everything that we stand for, taking care of one another, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, we care and we want to help them as God has helped us and blessed us. Welcome to worship. And let's prepare ourselves now as we listen to our Woodland Weekly Updates. Good morning and happy 4th of July. We are so glad that you are able to be with us today in this experience of worship. Our church office will be closed tomorrow, Monday, July 5th. We will reopen on Tuesday, July 6th at 9 a.m. If you are in need of help or emergency assistance, please call Pastor Michael. Quilt Ministry will meet this Wednesday, July 7th in room 301-303. We look forward to seeing you all there as we continue our work on chrismons and prayer quilts. Stretch and Walk will resume this Thursday, July 8th at 9.30 a.m. in the Family Life Center. All are welcome to come and be a part of this time of exercise and fellowship. Youth Group is on summer break. All youth gatherings will resume in August. And please continue to remember our youth group in your prayers as they travel this summer on their various mission trips. And it's not too late to register for our sewing camp, which begins on Monday, July the 12th. For more information, check out our church website or our Facebook page. And that's just a few of the things happening here at Woodland. Please remember to look at our Facebook page or our website for more information on church happenings. Please join in singing hymn number 697, America. reading for today comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. And Solomon said,
You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you've chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this, and you have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. The word of God. For the people of God, thanks be to God. And now we come to our time of prayer, and we begin with our congregational prayer. Let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus, we are no longer who we were. We are now becoming more and more who we are meant to be, who you always are. We are constantly listening to your voice as you continue sharing fresh new words and callings upon our lives. And as you cry out anew to each and every one of us, follow me, we are ever excited about the next amazing step in our faithful journey, a venture with you. And as we joyfully and thankfully walk day by day in your footsteps, O oh Lord, take hold of us anew, embrace us anew, Guide us anew, lift us up to new possibilities in your grace. Equip us, enable and empower us that we may go forth in your name and in your spirit and be a witness to your grace. In this moment, as we gather in worship, let us listen only to your voice and respond only to your call as we go forth in your spirit. Oh, gracious Lords, we thank you for all that you're doing for us. We lift up those who need a special touch upon their bodies, their minds and their spirits. We pray, Lord, even now they feel that special touch. Even now they feel the comfort of your presence. Even now they feel this prayer that they are loved. Not just that you are there, but we are there in our spirits and that the power of God is being unleashed in their lives and something amazing is happening. As you, Lord Jesus, grab a hold of them and let them feel your love and your comfort and your strength and your hope. And for all that you're doing right now for them, we celebrate. And Lord, we wish to testify, we have to testify to who we are because of you. That we are the family of God, the children of God, the people of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, followers of Christ. Oh Lord, we are your people. We are your presence in the world. And we testify to our oneness in this prayer, Lord, by sharing together in the very prayer that you, Lord Jesus, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to the time of receiving of our tithes and offerings. And there are several ways in which you can do this. You can give via text message following the instructions on the screen. You can mail your text into the office. Or you can go to our website and make a recurring gift or a one-time gift. However you choose to give, we pray that you will give generously to the work of this church and the work that is done in this community and the Greater United Methodist Church. Let us give now as God would so lead us to give.
Let us pray. O God, accept these gifts we place before you now. May the peace of God reign in our lives, the love of God surround us, the Spirit of God empower us, and the joy of God uphold us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we come to our reading from the Gospel. John 3, verses 1 through 11. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do not you, and do not you understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know. And we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Nicodemus comes to a very intelligent man. Reason, and he, his name Nicodemus suggests that he might have been a part of the diaspora, a part of the Jews who had fled, with his family had fled into the Greek regions. And, and being there, and, and that during that time, the Jews had been being persecuted even then. And, and so many of the family did not name their kids good Jewish names because they knew that would stand out that they were Jews. They wanted to hide, so they chose more Greek names like Nicodemus. And so he, he probably was a part of that group that ran away, his family who ran away during that time. But he had come back, and he had become a ruler and a leader. And so he's had a lot of understandings of the world. He also had learned to the Greeks about reason and logic and learning. And, and so he came to Jesus with all of this wisdom inside of him, and he said to Jesus that he, wanted, he, wanted, he knew he had to be a person of God because of all the things he was accomplishing. And then Jesus immediately went to a lesson. Um, he went to the lesson of you must be born again. Uh, How is this possible, he wants to know. How is it possible? you got to explain it to me. you got to make me understand it intellectually. It has to make sense to me for me to be able to grasp it. So please explain yourself. But Jesus doesn't. He doesn't do that. He just goes on and starts talking about it, what it means to be born again without any deep understanding or deep explanation because there really wasn't one. You know, I remember, you know, Paul said once about coming to Christ and following Christ. He said, the Jews seek a sign. The Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. Because we're talking about something that changes you. It changes who you are, how you see the world. And though you're going to sit down and try to understand how it happens, you may struggle forever and be frustrated forever. But can you just receive and experience and know through the experience of the change in you that something miraculous has happened? God has changed everything. So Jesus used an illustration of the wind with him. He says, well, the wind blows wherever it wants to blow. He makes out the wind just making decisions. I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go that way. Wind goes where it chooses to go. You don't 
see the wind, but you can see where it's been. You can see what it has touched. You can see the effect the wind has on that which it touches, whether it's the leaves of a tree or whether it's just the, the breeze on your face. You know it's there because you experience it, but you can't really explain where it comes from or where it's going. And you can try all you want, but that's not going to accomplish much. And while you're spending your time worrying about that, you're missing the glory of it all. You're missing the blessing of it all. You're missing the fact that it's there for you. Still reminds me of that story I like to share occasionally about my granddaughter when she was very young and as she was walking outside in her home and, and it was a very hot day and she was just sweating and hot and then this cool breeze suddenly came and touched her face and she smiled and she looked up and said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. A cool breeze. The breeze, what the Greeks call the pneuma, the, the, that little breeze that pushes, that pushes us along and leads us like a sail on a sailboat as we're pushed down the lake a little further. And we know it's there because we see what's happening to us. We see where we're going as a result of the push, but we don't understand how it comes about. We don't understand why we would even receive it. See, as people of faith, we have to realize that none of us deserve anything we have. So we can't sit down and ask God, or we can, but won't really get the answers any more than Nicodemus was able to get what he was asking about. About why me? Why would you choose me with all my faults? Maybe you don't really know everything I've done like I thought you did. But he knows. And yet he comes to you anyway. He introduces something called grace, but we never grasp it. We seem to not want to grasp it. Even today, religious people don't grasp the word of grace. They say the word, but they don't know what it means, or they don't allow it to have an effect upon their lives. And it's not that hard to understand. It's a gift. That's what grace is. But we don't want gifts. We want things we've earned. We want things we deserve. We want what we think is coming to us. So Nicodemus had a little struggle with this whole idea of a free gift, the whole idea of being changed by God, not something I have to do, no books I've got to read or lessons I've got to study, but just receiving a gift where I am, as I am, as we remember all the disciples and others that Jesus called during His journey on this earth were not the pick of the, of the litter as far as religious people were concerned. That's one of the reasons they were sure Jesus couldn't be the Messiah because he didn't go to any priest. He didn't go to any educated scholar. He went to fishermen. He went to a tax collector. He went to a, a person who was reported to have had seven demons inside of her and he called her. Obviously, he doesn't know how this works. If you want people, you've got to make sure they've earned their right to be there. You've got to understand that. So Jesus is introducing a new concept to an educated man, intelligent man, who believed that he had worked hard to get where he was in God's service. And he was being blessed with his position because of what he had done. And now Jesus is trying to tell him, you're not here because of what you've done, what you've accomplished. You're here because God wants you here. With me, God has chosen you not because, but in spite of everything, of who you are and what you've done. And so you have to grasp this. You have to understand this, what this love is like. This change is like. This presence of God is like. What this love of God in you is like. So Nicodemus is struggling with it. He is. And Jesus said, we tell you everything we've seen, everything we've heard, but you're not listening. You're not listening because it's not enough for you. Tell us what we can do. How many times have people throughout the Bible said that? What must I do to be saved? The jailer asked Paul when Paul 
when the earthquake came and the jail's doors were open and Paul and all the prisoners were suddenly free and they could have ran away and they could have took off and, and the jailer thought his prisoners were gone and he got a sword out. He was going to kill himself rather than face the humiliation and the possible persecution of himself and his family because of what they had gotten away under his charge, his responsibility. And Paul said, don't hurt yourself, we're still here. And the man came and saw that they were there. Why? It makes no sense. This is not logical. It's not reasonable that they would still be there when they should have run away. They should have thought only of themselves. That's what the rest of us do. And unfortunately in the church there are people who do the same. Think of themselves. What's in it for me and us and mine? I come to church to be fed. Never to feed. Never to help others find. I come here because I want something that's going to make me happy, make me satisfied, make me want to go and do. Not, I'm not here just for you, Lord. I've often said it, I always thought it would be funny if you walked up to Jesus and Jesus said to you, you know, I can't do anything for you. Uh, there's a rumor going around that I can get you to heaven, but truth is that's not the case. Uh, and then all of a sudden you start walking away from him. And he says, where are you going? And I thought you loved me. Nah, I just thought I could use you. <laughs> but now I find out that you're no good to me because you can't get me to things I want. So I'll just see for someone else out there. Or do you come to Jesus and say, whatever, Lord, I am yours. As John Wesley had said, I am yours. Let me have, let me not have. As the Wesleyan teaching in the Bibles, in the, in the book of worship says, let me have, let me not have. Let me walk with you, let me be away from you. Just whatever, Lord. Whatever, Lord, I'm yours. And I'm at your disposal. Because I know you love me. I know whatever you do is going to be the right thing for me. And I'm ready. When Nicodemus couldn't deal with it, he was struggling with it, but... Jesus was there for him to show him the way of love and compassion and giving and trust. And it's not about you. Maybe that's the one thing we have to always learn. I've seen movies that not have nothing, science fiction movies and all those things that have the same message. If you listen to it, the writers get, get the idea of what is going on and they, and they say it's not about you. Actually, I just saw Doc Savage again the other day. And when I was watching that movie, his mentor says to him near the end, just before the mentor dies, that there's one lesson that you need to learn, that maybe the reason you're having so much struggles is because you haven't learned that lesson yet. And Doc Savage wanted to know, what lesson are you talking about? And she said, it's simply this, it's not about you. <laughs> it's not about you. And then he, in the story, he does put himself out there, risk his eternity to save others. It's not about us. And Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, it's not about you understanding. It's not about making sure that you can reason it so that you can feel like you've earned the right to do this because you've figured it all out because you're so intelligent. You'll never figure it out. It's like the wind. And do you sit around complaining and discussing? When the wind blows, do you spend the next hour trying to analyze how this is going on? Or do you just bask in the wind, the breeze, the coolness? Do you celebrate the sounds around you because of it? Do you get up and find strength that you didn't have before because of it? In the midst of a hot day, and do you go forth celebrating and do you look up like my granddaughter and say, thank you, Jesus. I'm ready. I don't understand why I'm here. I don't know why you chose me. I don't know why you want me to be the one that goes forth and does this work. But I know now it wasn't because I was the smartest and it wasn't because I had the most education and it wasn't because I worked so hard to get here because all the work I did didn't make me worthy of you. I know it's because you love me and you chose to call me. 
and that you're sending me forth as a witness. And let me go forth and be able to show others what I have discovered in myself. That all you got to do is let go. Stop trying so hard and let Jesus come and take hold of you. Be born again. Become a different person. See, that's what salvation is. It's not that you have accepted certain beliefs and now you know you're going to heaven. It's because Christ has come. He has breathed on us the Holy Spirit. And it changed the way we see the world and the evidence of my faith and my salvation and my relationship is who I've become in love, unconditional love and caring and seeing people as everyone being important in my life. Let's remember that today. As we go forth and love as Jesus loved, as we see people as Jesus sees them, and as to every time the wind blows, let's remember the same word for the breeze is the same word for spirit. The Spirit is moving about us every day, just like the breeze. And every time we see it, let's be reminded. And let's smile and say, thank you, Jesus. God's blessings upon you as you go forth in His name, in His Spirit. Amen. Amen.